what I call logic and statistics, I know I didn't define it very well, can be done without a lot of, um, without a lot of mathematics. Um, and it can be done for maybe simple to almost intermediate problems. So you, you, you know, you, you're not stuck with just having to talk about normal distributions and very convenient assumptions. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Today's guest is Keith O'Rourke. He is part of uh, O'Rourke Consulting and also Health Canada. And this conversation simply reflects his views and not those of his employer. And what we're going to be talking about today is the logic of statistics in a very deep field. I'm very excited about this uh, in some of our conversations. Keith is the first person who's brought up uh, C.S. Pierce in casual conversation before, which is very exciting. Um, and um, did a lot of interesting things up ahead. So, Keith, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And so I guess maybe we should just start off with the question, you know, what is scientific statistics to you? Uh, to me, it's uh, the purposeful use of statistics to learn about the world in a future tense. So we want to kind of form uh, expectations or a schema of what will happen in the world when we do X or Y or Z. And we hope very much that when we do that, we're not gonna be frustrated. Like we're not gonna fall off a cliff or be eaten by an animal. And uh, it, it, one of the things I've been actually reading up on while well, listening to a bit, uh, the Carl Friesten, and I don't know if you know about his um, free energy principle, which really is, you know, actually very statistical. Um, and he kind of makes the point that any organism to survive has to isolate themselves from the environment, but also represent the environment somehow by receiving signals and then use that representation from the signals to decide how to act on the environment so that they get to eat rather than being eaten. And it's, it, it's kind of maybe still fairly controversial, but it's quite interesting. Um, and um, but the point, one of the more interesting points is that uh, if organisms survive, they've actually somehow figured out how to implement a scientific statistics. In other words, dealing with the world and the uncertainties out there in a way to survive. Um, which is, is kind of interesting, but uh, so I, I think really what it is, is it's, you know, purposely using statistics to uh, create expectations of the world that won't be frustrated when you act. And, you know, you could think about descriptive statistics as sort of, you know, what happened last year, which is kind of, system, kind of different. And it's why I use that term, it's, it's in the dead past. It's it's over and done with. Um, so it's it's this future orientation that's that's really important. Yeah, and on the issue of the future orientation. So, for example, we have um, many people are familiar with the the problem of induction that David Hume talked about, where effectively we have these observations, and as you call it, the dead past. Um, but what we care about is what's what's around the bend, um, and we have no logical guarantee that what it was like in the past will continue to be the same way in the future. Um, and so there's that disconnect. Is this part of that issue that you're talking about? Or are there other aspects as well? well? No, I mean, that's what it seems that has to be dealt with. And I, I, you mentioned uh, Charles Sanders first. Uh, and he's kind of pretty much set that aside saying, well, it really doesn't matter. You have to inquire and you have to act and you have to continue to inquire. And so, um, you know, the, the, the past will not be like the future, it'll change. Hopefully not too quickly, but you have to keep inquiring. So you just, um, and there's really no alternative. You know, you either have to try and uh, form expectations of this world that you won't be frustrated with. There's no alternative. So if, if the world changes too quickly in a certain area, you, you might go extinct. Can't do. There's no. There's no alternative. So you just have to try. So uh, then, I guess, what would be the logic of statistics? 
statistics. I guess the, the, the what we're going to talk about is, you know, the logic of statistics. So if that's scientific statistics, what is the logic of it? Right. And, and I think the pretty much everything I think of, a lot of what I think of draws from uh, Hearst. Um, and, and to him, logic w was not a narrow field. A lot of people think of logic as sort of formal deductive reasoning. To him, it was sort of uh, any way of, of um, producing good inquiry. You know, and, and again, mostly learning. It's not just, you know, more generally, not just learning about the world, but also learning about abstractions that we make. Um, and it, it, it's really just the process of learning. And, and if you're learning about an abstraction, you can do it deductively. So there you want to, as you said, represent and re-represent in ways that you know won't won't take you astray. So your re-representation has to be uh, completely valid. Uh, but we, we reason all the time, and you know we even have the, the thing he had the biggest problem with, and he, he never really resolved in his career or lifetime was um, what he called abduction, which is coming up with hypotheses, hypotheses, and he. We like to think it was a logic, a very weak form of logic, uh, and he tried to justify it, but in in the end, he never quite succeeded. Was he but, the originator of the term abduction? Uh, he might have been, but he also used he always uses a number of words. So he he called it abduction, retroduction, retroduction, hypothesis, guessing. Um, I mean, one of the things about uh, Peirce, which is worthwhile, maybe knowing is that he he never like um i forget the name of the philosopher who said that he started everything and finished nothing so so what purse did is is he kept on reconsidering things over and over again and every time he went back he would bring up further considerations but he'd never really get it to closure and i think he really felt that trying to get to closure was was a mistake that really all you can do in, in science um, is decide to take pauses until you can feel the opportunities good again, or the what he called the economy of research. The economy of research is worthwhile to try and take it further. So anyone trying to read Peirce, he's, he's very frustrating because uh, you know he doesn't get the closure. If he ever does get the closure, if you come back and read him again, he'll go somewhere else. So. Uh, but he's worthwhile. Actually, it's Deborah Mayo who, who put it nicely once. You don't read purse for answers. You read purse for inspiration to get sort of, as I would put it, find out about the things that he considered and how he took those considerations through. And then that will help you do better better science or better, philo better philosophy. But um, Yeah. And just for those who aren't as familiar, you know, purse, uh, I think he was like the first person to propose that uh, we could use, uh, for example, electrical circuits to perform logical operations and things like that. Yeah, so he did that. He, he, had, he had a graduate. It's, it's a cute story. He had a graduate student. He used to have logic pianos, right? Certain keyboards would work out certain syllogisms. But you had to have a really good carpenter to build it. And one of his graduate students had problems getting a good carpenter and one quit. So Per said, well, why don't you just use electronic um, switching circuits? So. Um, that was kind of the the instance. Yeah. So yeah, um, he it really interesting ideas. Um, on the issue of we talked about, you know, reasoning and abstraction. What is um one of the things I want to talk to you about was the role of representation in statistics, and eventually get around to this idea of diagrammatic reasoning in statistics. Um, so uh, what is the role of representation in statistics, and you know how how is that essentially bringing together? you know, the mathematical formalism, the real world, how does that all get funneled together? Well, the, 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 the mathematical abstractions, they're abstract. We make them uh, and we make them as we make them and they are what they are. Uh, and you can learn about their, their, what they imply. You can learn uh, about everything that's contained in that representation with that, with that abstraction you've made. But if you're going to try and learn about the world, you have to realize that you're using a model 
as a representation. It's supposed to kind of connect somehow with the world. And so then, you know, when you've kind of worked through the implications of the abstraction, you then think they're kind of, they're going to be similar or analogous to how the world works. But, but somehow the mathematics has to connect with the world if you're going to be learning about the world rather than just about the abstraction. And most of what we do in statistics, everything that's done in, in mathematics, is just learning about the abstraction. Right? And in statistics, a lot of the work we do, we're just learning about those abstractions. And then somehow we have to transport that understanding to expectations about what will repeatedly happen in the world. Right? If you have expectations of what's going to happen, that's a sense of what will rep repeatedly occur. Right? We, we don't expect the same thing to happen every time. Like, to go back, sort of back in the 1800s, when they started taking uh, photographs of people, they would do things like um, take photographs of all the, uh, the female actors in movies and overexpose them on the same uh, picture. And what they got was kind of an average picture of a, a, a female actor at that time. That's kind of the, the average uh, female actor. You, that, that makes sense? You know, you go. Yeah, so far. Yep. So far. It, it's kind of like averaging, yes. And it, now, today, I think we should be thinking about the distribution, right? And I think, you know, this is kind of, we all have these distributions about expectations of things like if we're watching a, a new movie and there's a new female act, media actor and you haven't seen them before, you'll have a set of expectations, a distribution of things that they'll look like. Okay. And so that's kind of very statistical, right? It's a distribution. And it provides you a set of expectations for how to confront the world, right? And, and, and if, if that female actor looks very different than your distribution of past female actors, you're going to be very surprised. And um, you know, I don't know if that makes sense or... Yeah. I guess uh, so. I guess connecting it back to the uh, representation. So I guess the. Um, I guess well, here, so. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so usually uh, people talk about assuming models when they're doing statistics, right? And I think sometimes they're thinking about when well, you have to assume models, it's just uh, a cost to getting quantitative results. You know, it's something that's like paying taxes, it's something right. you have to do. But if you think about it, what you're really doing is you're representing. The world somehow. Right? If you say um, uh, you, you, you have a, a model with a parameter space, um, well, you're you're kind of saying, well, those outcomes can occur in this world, right? That's why I'm assuming this model, and so really, you should be thinking about it as a representation. The rep representation, something that stands for something else in some aspect for some purpose, right? So if we're doing statistics, we're trying to learn about the world, okay? We assume this model, but we should realize that we're taking that model as a representation of the world for some aspect, right? So... Um, but you, you, people even don't like the word sometimes using representation as a synonym for models. Is that and where, it, for example, like diagram, like diagrammatic learning comes in? Well, I, I think we can separate. I mean, diagrammatic uh, learning is just a way of learning about a mathematical abstraction. But if, if you think you just you have this abstract model, it's mathematics, got nothing to do with this world. But if you're using it to learn about this world, well, then you're using it as a representation. It's sort of standing in place of the actual world, right? It's like this idea of a Markov blanket where you have to separate yourself from the world. 
it's really dangerous to bring things into your brain, right? <laughs> right. So, so somehow in, in your brain, you have to represent the world. Right. And, and in statistics, we're, we're doing that with models, in particular probability models. Um, and so, and a lot of it comes from, like, I started out a long time before I took statistics. I studied something called uh, semiotics, which they call the theory of signs, or better today, theory of representations. It's how something comes to rep represent something else for some purpose. And so, it was really easy for me to see, well, if you're making assumptions in statistics, well, then you're kind of taking something as a representation because you're, you're, you're assuming those models because you want to learn about the world, right? And so if you're doing that, you're essentially using it as, as representations for the world, as stand-ins for the world. So one of the ways that, you know, we're talking about this, and I think Andrew Gelman has as well, and, and we we had this difficulty whether we call them fake worlds or whatever, but you can think of this, you know, you, know, you, you can think of these um, probability models, okay, as fake worlds. Now, because it's an abstraction, you can learn everything you want about that world, right? You can learn all of the, all the implications, okay? Whereas, in the world, when you observe some data, you can't observe it again, right? You can't put your foot in the same river twice, twice right? Yep. Yeah. So, but if you use the probability model and say that data could have been generated by this probability model, right, in an idealized sense, okay, well, now you can learn about what, re what would re be, what would repeatedly happen in that fake world, if it was true. And then there's a hope that that fake world is close to the actual world that you have to deal with. And so you know what would repeatedly happen in that world. And so then you can use, you know, kind of transport that to what would repeatedly happen in the world. I mean, one of the things that allow you to do is it sort of allows you to work out um, how compatible the observation is with that probability model, right? If it's in the tails of that probability model, something that you'd seldom observe if that model was true, okay, well, then it's not very compatible. And there's various people that have, have worked this up, like uh, Sander Greenland, and she worked it out into sort of compatibility assessments and compatibility intervals rather than confidence intervals. And it's, but, but, but the key here, the point I'm trying to make, is to get that, you have to assume that a fake world is true. That's abstract. Now you can learn everything about that. And now you have to relate that to the observation you have. So the observation you have, you can see where it's in the, in, in, if it's in the tails of that fake world, well, it's not, that compatible with that fake world, right? And, yeah. and if, if you change, each time you change, let's say for instance, the mean, well, you're changing the fake world, right? And, and so you can, you can work through basic statistics like that. What about the uh, issue of counterfactuals that you brought up that I thought was very interesting and it seems like it's spot on. This is about as good a time to bring it up as any, sure. or effectively that the, the probability distribution is something like a, a counterfactual. Yeah, it allows you to affect, you know, because what's counterfactual is what, what you would observe next time, which you can't do. Yeah. Because right? uh, the world's going to change even a second from now or whatever. Uh, so it allows you to get at that counterfactual, right? What, what would repeat, what would be repeated, re, what would be repeatedly re observed in the world. Okay, you go to a probability model abstract. And you can work it out there, and then you kind of have to like transport it to your observation. What do you think? Um, what do you think? Sort of the best takeaway for you know these early stage young statisticians and data scientists would be from these sort of ideas, um, because you know I think one of the challenges is that when people are just getting started out in the field, they have a lot of 
the essentially the mathematical, the mechanics inflicted upon them. Um, and not so much the connection. So effectively, they they become it's like, well, one thing that we can always test people on is we can train them in the abstractions. We can train them in the math. It's very easy to assess the math. What's not easy to assess is if they're a competent scientist, um, which is especially difficult because, you know, becoming a competent scientist takes a long time, whereas you can train someone up in the math in about a year. Um, you know, you can teach them to code within about six months and then, you know, get them pretty good at coding. So effectively, they can go through the motions of being a statistician or being going through the motions of being a data scientist. Um, but then there's all that other stuff out there. What 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 would be a good roadmap? Not, not a roadmap, just, you know what you're talking about. What would be a good takeaway message for young people? No, I mean, actually, thinking a bit about that uh, this morning, and, 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 and probably, you know, my sense would be, uh, ideally, they would do this stuff in a pre-statistics course. You know, if anyone's going to be a professional statistician, there's a lot of technical math you have to learn. It's, it's different in different areas, depending on where you go in. Uh, but you, you really, if, if you certainly if you're going to be doing research in statistics or really trying to be, uh, you know, the best or the best, trying to be a best statistician you can be, there's a lot of math you have to do at some time. I think a lot of these ideas can be done before that. Um, and, you know, it's we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I think I sent you some material where I use um, simulation and then I point out that, you know, Bayes can be done with what's called a direct or two-stage or ancestral yeah. simulation. That doesn't take a lot of technical skills. The and then you can bring in, sorry. Oh, go, go, go on. I was about to say the interesting bit. Go on, please. Yeah. And, and then you can bring in uh, like Bayesian workflow, like uh, Michael Bedencourt and other Andrew Gilman's colleagues work with, where you kind of interrogate how well your Bayesian analysis worked, right? Because if, you know, you know with a Bayesian workflow, you're going to have to do the same ancestral simulations anyways, even if you can do MCMC sampling. You're going to have to do this uh, two-stage simulation to assess whether that worked very well, because you're going to have to assess first does the prior that I've used, that is, does it, you know, does it imply marginal priors that make sense to me? So you have to simulate from the prior to, to sort of check the prior. And then you have to simulate from the prior, and then you have to simulate the data given the parameter you got prior to see if your Bayesian model generates um, observations, potential observations or fake observations that are like what you see in the world. So you have to do those steps. So, you know, this this whole, what, what I call logic and statistics, I know I didn't define it very well, can be done without a lot of, um, without a lot of mathematics. Um, and it can be done for maybe simple to almost intermediate problem so you, you you know you're not stuck with just having to talk about normal distributions and very convenient assumptions and one of the ways that the bayesian workflow uh, works is you say okay i'm gonna uh my data generating model let's say my, my prior is going to be normal and my data generating model is going to be normal but what you do in the in the bayesian workflow is you change that. So you make the prior something else and you make the data generating model something else. And you say, well, this could be more like the world. I won't know that. So I'll use my normal, normal Bayesian model to try and learn about it. How well do I do? And the thing that saves us the statistics is you usually do not too badly, right? There's some mismatches that will get you a lot of trouble. But you can get away with a lot of miss, you know, not representing the world that exactly and still kind of, you know, uh, form expectations that reasonably are well met. Um, so that we've kind of got a little bit ahead of that. Now, one of the problems when you do that with people that don't have a lot of statistical knowledge, 
then they don't appreciate it. Because it looks too simple from them. Too, too simple for them. Right? I'm simulating from the prior. Okay, I got that parameter value. I simulate the data. I do that over and over again. And then I just keep from that gives you the joint distribution. But then I just keep those of the joint distribution that match my observation. And that's the posterior. Because other people have used this to teach novices uh, Bayesian statistics. Um, Richard McKelthreath is one, and uh, uh, a few other people. They say what happens is the students find it just too, like uh, trying to learn skiing on the bunny hill. They want to get, they want to go down the steep slopes right away, or they want to learn to do real statistics yeah, and real. MCMC sampling. And it, often, I think the most introductory Bayesian courses, uh, almost all the time is spent dealing with MCMC sampling. And there's no time spent really, well, how do you choose prior? What's the downside of choosing it badly? We, have to change, we also have to choose the data models. And, and how would you ever, I mean, it, it's all blind, right? It, it, you know, the, the usual course, you usually, you'll usually say, well, use a default prior, they, they work okay. Um, and then use your regular data generating model, you usually assume. Run the MCMC, spend a lot of time checking that it's converged, and then the posterior is your answer. And, and it's totally blind to this sort of scientific reasoning. So the, the scientific reasoning is, you know, you've represented the world in a certain model. You've worked out the implications of that model. You've assessed the compatibilities with what you've learned from your, from all the implications of your models with the data in hand, and then you decide whether to go with it or not. Do you think so? The disconnect between that is uh, between essentially the I wouldn't exactly call it Bayesian workflow, but all the, just for that, like essentially their statistical workflow. Do you think that, that there's a, some disconnect where effectively anyone can learn how to turn the crank on their statistical workflow? Uh, but how do you actually turn the crank on your stati uh, scientific workflow? Like there is no one crank to do it, you know, where effectively the science, the scientific reasoning is the big nebulous answer uh, or the, the, ne the nebulous question. So effectively, people can operationalize one aspect of it. They can't operationalize the other. And therefore, they choose to sort of really dig in on the one thing that they can't operationalize. Is that is that a fair assessment, or am I missing something? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure, because there's, there's a few things that come up here. One is, like, I, I did this material with my son when he was a teenager, and he, he looked at me and said, Dad, I get it. I see what's happening, you know. Two-stage sampling is pretty easy to understand. But shouldn't there be a formula that does a better job? Right. right. And I think that's part of the disconnect. The sort of expectations that uh, math is always better um, and you should be doing math. Um, the like like science is very hard. You know, it's extremely hard. Um, and I think there, there is a temptation to just um, use what you learned in graduate school, which is mostly just the mathematics, and just take that as providing your answer. Um, I remember something, a talk I saw a few years ago where someone made this point, I think it's true for most of us. In your university training, almost no one talks about scientific reasoning. You know, they. They kind of mostly just, well, this is the way we do science, or this is the way we write statistics papers. You know, they expect this and they expect that. No one really gets into the larger question, uh, as the, the, the speaker I'm sort of mentioning said, how do we know what we know? And, and, and part of the problem is, um, at least in my mind, is one of my uh, philosophy colleagues uh, told me once, that his, one of his uh, faculty members described philosophy as 
asking wild, large, childlike questions and arguing over the answers like lawyers. And, you know, philosophy has its place, but most people don't have the, 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 the time or aptitude to go through that. And what they really want is something that's going to help them do better science. Or, you know, and, you know, I, I keep trying to think of a better term than philosophy of science. And, you know, the only thing you have to come up with is sort of theory of purposeful inquiry. But it, it's really, it's, it's all this. It's how do you learn about the world profitably? So, you know, profitably in the sense of, being able to act with less frustration. Um, and, and that's not taught anywhere. So, uh, and, you know, it's, so, so, I mean, so to test, go back to the original trying to answer your question, if we had a pre-calculus, pre-statistics uh, course that taught sort of scientific inquiry and use these simpler, like, things like two-stage sampling. And you can leave the prior off and just make a about classical statistics. Um, and, and so it, it's just a way of um, really focusing on uh, using probability models to represent how the observations could have been generated. And then using simulation to learn about those because that's really easy to do. Uh, and then doing this mismatch where you, you know, represent something one way and analyze it, thinking you was represented another way and, and seeing what happens and what can go wrong. Yeah. The issue of essentially using more computational based approaches and simulation based approaches to help students learn to me seems like I've been thinking about this for quite some time that there are it seems like it could be very profitable, at least for a certain subset of students, um, where um, if you essentially have that more that more like interactive aspect to it, it's computational, so it, it keeps it very simple. Um, essentially, computational approaches to teaching statistics as opposed to analytical approaches to teaching statistics. Um, and I've it isn't just in statistics. There are other fields too where I think it can be very helpful. For example, signal processing. I think it could be immensely helpful where effectively a lot of the analytical ways that they teach the topic of signal processing um, tends to lose students unnecessarily on certain details. Um, where if you taught it computationally, it would lend the topic more to the scientific applications for which it's used. Um, and I think I think that there I think there are plenty of areas like that where if you if they taught things computationally i and i i haven't quite connected why that would be other than i think that people just learn by different re have different modes of learning well I, again it, it, you know um you know it, computation is a very general term yeah um and um i, I think you you you, you, you um, one of the things i worry is but often it can be seen just like a black box and uh, one of the things I try and do, I, I go th can go through this very quickly. I, I use the digits of pi as uh, a basis to generate zero you know, uh, uniform random numbers. And then I take pairs of them and use rejection sampling to get other distributions, just so there's, there's a black, not, you know, there's no black box there. Yeah. You know, that's a very inefficient way <laughs> To simulate from let's say a normal distribution, but it's very easy to understand, and then you can use the more efficient ones. So I think you do have to make some effort um, to make it clear how simulation works, right? So that it doesn't just become a black box. Now, one of the problems or one of the challenges is going to be uh, if you're going to use probability models to represent more than trivial problems, you know. That starts to become very challenging to, to like represent, um, you know, because you're going to have to put together a bunch of probability models, and that's a skill in itself. Um, so, but I, 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 a, lot, a lot of it might be driven just by, you know, I remember one year I, I taught at Duke University, uh, of course, in introductory statistics, 
And you have all the rest of the university or different faculty members, they, they, they have certain expectations of what their students are going to learn in your course. And so you really don't have a lot of freedom to design your own course in most universities. And you also don't have the time. It takes a lot of time. It's far quicker to just use the same old worn out <laughs> pedagogy that everyone else has used in the textbook with you know the, the answer keys and, and, and spend as little time. Because you know, you know, yeah, unfortunately, academics have a lot of pressure. And, and so uh, if you're not doing certain things and you know, getting publications and other stuff, and so you really can't afford to put a lot of time into kind of uh, exploring um, how, to, how to teach statistics with computation. Yeah, it's why I think, actually, I, I won't open up that can of worms, uh, but just as a quick, as a, as a quick rewind, you know, uh, one thing that I think is worth pointing out, though, is that, you know, the analytical approaches to teach statistics, the moment somebody zones out the math behind it, that becomes a black box as well. Um, and so effectively, I think it's effectively you can choose your black box. And to me, it seems like the computational approaches are far less black boxy. The, the steps are simpler. You know, there's no thing where someone just like skips a step and says QED or whatever. Um, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, yeah. they're less black boxy, but it doesn't mean that certain people aren't going to take them as black boxes. Yeah. So I'm yeah, saying I mean, you yeah. just, you know, you pull that apart. Um, and, um, I think maybe the other thing would help is just is use it in this misspecified model way, you know, you know, uh, simulate um, data one way and simulate it a different way to try and learn about it so there's a mismatch. Um, there's something, I, I don't know how familiar the Asian statisticians are about this, but there's someone who uh, was investigating confidence interval coverage of uh, Bayesian models. And they did it uh, using the same model. <laughs> they used it using the correct model. So in a Bayesian model, if, if the model is correct, the confidence interval coverage is exactly 5%. Right. Right. Um, but not everyone knows that. Like I, you know, various people who, you know, they're doing Bayesian statistics and I, point that out and they go, I, I didn't know that. Um, but that's a very, what you really want to do is misspecify the model so that it's not, and, and it's 5% on average. Right. If, if you fix a parameter, it could be 10% or 1%. Um, but it's, but I, I think, I mean, you know, at the bottom, it, it's just science is very difficult. And then, you know, also learning and teaching is very difficult as well. And it, it's really hard to know um, when you've like given a lecture or something exactly what people are taking away with from it. Mm -hmm. I think one, there's also a big problem where, you know, you can't really begrudge people for becoming fairly mercenary very quickly, or they just become extremely practical on like, do I need to know this? And I don't learn anything beyond that because, you know, like essentially, they get funneled through decades of schooling by which they're graded on. They literally have this. Um, it's a really cheap cost function by which I mean, it's like a poorly designed cost function. Or it's it's not a um, you're not doing uh, like multivariate optimization or uh, multi. Um, uh, darn the, the words point on my head, but essentially you're not doing like uh, um, you're not doing a multiple cost function. You're optimizing on one cost function. It's basically like, did you learn enough? to pass a given test. And there's no reward for knowing things about that. And not to mention that the test is being designed to untestable things, which is the other, which is the, I think the more fundamental bit, but effectively we basically spend all this time convincing large number of people to be, you know, totally mercenary and narrow focused on, on what the value is. And then once they come out into like the light of day, it's like, oh, now all these other things matter. Um, Kind of, sort of, because even then you don't particularly get rewarded on them. Um, but it just, it does seem like um, essentially they get trained, they get overtrained, if you will. They get trained on this very narrow set of problems um, because on, by virtue of need to grade and have this sort of academic system. 
oh, they get funneled through. And it's not a surprise to me that essentially scientific science and creativity, and I think that's another thing that I think science is such a fundamentally creative thing, um, that the same aspect of education that kills creativity in so many people is the thing that kills their scientific capabilities as well. Like, I think the, the, those are twins and they get, they both get poisoned. And I, I think you're right. I hope oh, my daughter's okay with this. When, when, when she went to undergraduate university, I, I would talk to her and say, uh, don't focus so much on getting high marks. Focus on learning important things. Um, of course, um, she didn't believe me. <laughs> it's normal for, for kids to do that. And it was a few years after she got out of the university and she, she told me, yeah, you were right. And she'd been focusing on learning important things. And for some reason myself, I did that in university. Um, I know it used to startle some professors when they say, oh, I, I'll let you rework on this assignment so you can get an A. I think I had a B or a B plus. And I said, why in the world would I want to do that? You know, and, and when I was in you know, undergraduate uh, university, actually most of the time I was in university, I was always going to different seminars in different departments and, you know, reading other stuff and, and just kind of following my interests. Um, but, uh, you know, as most people, you're right, Glenn, they're, they're trained and, uh, like I experienced that, uh, you know, when I was teaching, you know, teaching at Duke University, is how do I get whatever grade I want to get with different targets with the least amount of effort? And they were very upset if you made if if, if you made them think through things or work through things, or or, or try to understand something other than just kind of provide them with. A quick route to get their B plus, and then they can go on to other things. Um, so uh, obviously, we've talked a, quite a bit about the challenges of learning statistics, and I think one of the things that you and I both agree on is the value of, for example, metaphor, or I like to use analogies when learning about concepts, just any concepts in general. Um, why is it that you think that metaphors are particularly useful for learning? Uh, well, I like them. I mean, the basic idea is you uh, transport an understanding in a familiar area to a less familiar area. Um, and uh, we could go into the semiotics, but that would take us the rest of the hour, but they're very interesting objects. Uh, and uh, there's a few that I think have worked well uh, for me. Um, one is actually kind of a, a joke. It's a Picasso joke. And it's um, Picasso painted a, a picture of this uh, husband's wife and the husband met Picasso at a party and said, Picasso, that painting of my wife does not look like her at all. And he goes, oh, really? What does she look like? So he takes a picture out of his wallet and shows it Picasso. Here, she looks like this. Picasso goes, my, she's awfully tiny. <laughs> So that's kind of a metaphor because people, when, when I talk about, you know, probability models as representing how the data were generated, you know, the first impression was well, they're not really like that, or you know, it's not exactly like that. Well, representations are kind of, they're like this, this little painting. They don't have to get all aspects, right? They just have to get the, the important ones. Uh, the other one I like is using uh, shadows as a, metaphor for statistics and that's so you see a shadow uh, but you can't look at what's casting it and what we're doing in statistics is we're trying to learn about what's casting it we don't care about the shadow per se so that's like uh, the observations in our study they're the dead past <laughs> we really just want to use those to learn about what will repeatedly happen in the future um, the other one that the chemists like because they actually do this is they spike uh, known amounts of chemicals and test tubes and then they take machine readings and then they sort of calibrate the machine readings um sort of they're, they're really working out the the distribution of machine readings for the the known amount they put into the test tubes and that's kind of what we're doing in statistics but we have to use probability models because 
we can't uh, spike certain things like cancer rates or uh, return on investment. So we have to make these uh, probability models to do that. Do you think that uh, one of the reasons, getting back to you know the the conversation is about uh, you know diagrammatic reasoning and representation is that are these metaphors helpful because effectively it's easier sometimes to manipulate the metaphor in our mind to make progress? Um, no, I, I think metaphors were more like uh, schemas. They create sort of expectations of a certain area. Uh, and, and that's why uh, that was something I mentioned about the semiotics is that, uh, or even with the, the first in material at the beginning, I think our minds form expectations of stuff. So a metaphor is a way of implanting expectations, right? So you you have these, these great expectations about shadows and now you wanna sort of set them up for statistics. Uh, and so it gives you a set of things to expect in statistics that you wouldn't have ex expected before. The, the, the diagrammatic reasoning is as far as um, I can tell that's just a medium of mathematics, right? Because if you have an abstract quantity, those are mathematical quantities. If you don't have any other kind. Uh, you want to discern uh, the forms of relationship in that. However, you do that. If it's just a re however you do that, as long as it's a reliable may way of doing it, that's mathematics. So whether you're doing it with symbols or with a diagram, um, you know, you can, you can do diagrammatic proofs. People used to think those weren't very good, but, you know, they've since argued that they can be as accurate as deductions, you know, if you do them carefully enough. Um, can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, what, why is, why, how are, for example, these, well, why do people think that this wasn't as, as good as, I guess, mathematical deduction? Well, because I, I think people did poor, <laughs> you know, they, they do diagrams loosely and, 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 mm -hmm. and would, would draw incorrect conclusions. So you can do that with any form. You can do that with any form of mathematics. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, does mathematics in many ways, traditional mathematics, it's very good at forcing you to be very rigorous and precise. And when people then jump to a more diagrammatic approach, that they might well, I, lose the precision or what? There's arguments that you can make the diagrammatical approach as rigorous. But I, I, that's not really a, its feature. Its feature is, is it, it's just easier for most people to understand. I mean, it, again, like anything else from my, what I'm working on, comes from, from Peirce, who defined mathematics as performing experiments on uh, on diagrams or symbols instead of chemicals. And so it's, it's just experimental reasoning uh, performed on the abstraction. And the diagram just makes it clearer that that's what you're doing. So um, like you, 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 you can sort of draw any arbitrary triangle and prove it has 180 degrees by sort of just manipulating lines and checking angles and, and you'll, you'll do it. And so that's kind of a diagrammatical approach to proving that all triangles have 180 degrees. If you don't mind me just hopping back onto the, uh, the science for like uh, the, the scientific as aspects. Um, do you think that given some of the challenges and the turn the crank aspects that practicing statistics has sort of picked up as its burden. Do you think science has become too statistics focused? Yeah, I, I, I think if, if you, let me first answer it a little bit differently. I think it's too single study. You know, the idea that you can learn anything from a single study is to be a little bit bizarre. You know, occasionally we may be in a situation where we can only have one study, uh, but usually there's going to be more, usually half a dozen or a dozen. And so I think it, it, it's a big mistake in, in statistics that for some reason, everyone thought you could just focus on one study at a time. 
it's a, it's a big problem in academia where you know, authors are expected to come to conclusions based on their one study. Well, yeah, you know, this is one of maybe a dozen studies. No one should be trying to get conclusions from one. And when I first started in statistics back in the mid 80s, I was at the University of Toronto and I started working with some clinical researchers and I worked out for them how to do meta analysis. I had just learned uh, generalized linear modeling. And so the studies we we're working on had binary outcomes. So that's logistic regression, and you put an intercept in for the study. So each study allows a different control rate because patients can be sicker in different centers. And then you look for a common treatment effect, and then you check if there's an interaction between treatment effect and study. It's sort of the heterogeneity question. It was, it was very straightforward to work out. And then we started doing it, and then the whole university all the statisticians and biostatisticians were very upset at me and thought I was being a complete fool for showing people how to do meta-analysis because they should know that you're not supposed to try and do that. Um, and there was this general pushback uh, for years and years about looking at more than one study at a time. And you shouldn't. And, and you know, all you should really do for a single study is you know, do your best to represent what happened and what what you observed, and then let someone else come along when there's a half a dozen or so studies to actually try and draw conclusions from it. You know, and, and, and the other one is more to your um, pulling the crank. There, there's too there's too much of uh, too much use of convention, right? Um, we need defaults, but we, we want to avoid just conventions. I mean, um, Andrew Gilman and I wrote a little commentary, I don't know, maybe it's 10 years ago or so, about how statisticians choose what statistical method to use. And the biggest predictor is where they went to graduate school. <laughs> well, that's what I learned to do in graduate school. So <laughs> that's how I'm going to do your analysis. Um, and uh, I remember I was talking to a young researcher a few years ago, and they had done this really nice experiment. And the results were actually kind of clear. And I was talking to them about how they could display it in the graph and make it very obvious what happened in, in their experiment. And they kept on, no, 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 how do I put it into analysis of variance? How do I put it in an OVA table? How do I get an OVA table? And I kept on trying, trying to tell her, do this first. I'll put it into an ANOVA table so you can show people, but you should do this first so we understand what's going on. And they never got back to me. I figure they probably bumped into a statistician who could show them how to make it into an analysis of variance, and that's what they did. Um, but it, it, you know, it, 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 it's you know, it, people like to be sophisticated, and they also use all these conventions and and in uh, academia, like if you submit a paper in your area and they're expecting analysis of variance, you're going to maximize your chance of being published by putting it in like that. So uh, I think it's it's um, it's maybe default thinking and, and too much convention. When when I was actually first uh, taught to do applied statistics, it was actually by David Andrews at the University of Toronto years ago. And he always taught us to uh, think the problem through by first principles. Don't look in the methods book. Don't look at how other people analyze it. Just think about the problem and what the experimenter is trying to learn and what they did and what they observed and try and you know, make an analysis from first principles. Uh, and then, of course, before you finish, do check the literature to see what other people are doing. But they do the other first, and but that's hard. It's that's hard. Actually, it's time consuming. Sorry. I was say that's really interesting because um, I've I've been writing up some lectures on KL divergence, and the way that I wanted to teach it was not by jumping immediately to the answer, but essentially saying like, okay, if we just started with this basic problem, how would you, off the top of your head, propose 
to resolve it. And we can try it this way and like, and then since essentially we work our way and see what the what the implications of that metric are, and then I propose an alternative metric, and we work it, and we get out to like the uh, some uh, the like von Mises uh, criterion or uh, von Mises metrics. Um, I'm not I'm not, um uh, and then uh, uh then doing another way, and we get to some like Kamal Gross Smirnoff test, and essentially we try it different ways and see where each of those tests go, and what I attempt to demonstrate to anyone who would listen on this would be that um, eventually after we cure the shortcomings of these other methods um, or sort of essentially correct them, we get pretty darn close to uh, uh, callback libeler divergence. And it's like, it's like, okay, actually, if we just sat around and tested and played around with enough, we could actually produce something pretty darn close to what these geniuses in our field came up with. Um, if you just kept working on it. And um, so I thought that was interesting. And, my hope was that by spending the first, say, 10 minutes on a lecture doing this, um, I was able, well, first 10 minutes, was like a three-part lecture, the first part just coming up with this, is that then it's not some magical thing handed down to them. They're actually very comfortable with the concept. And from that, they can have a more profitable engagement and they can use it more dynamically. It's like a Swiss Army knife where you've put it together yourself. Um, well, I, so. I think it'll be, a, it'll be a, a great benefit to them as long as they'll go along with it, that's you know that's a bit of a challenge. But I think it's certainly uh, a great way to sort of teach um, an understanding of statistics, as opposed to just this is how it's done, this is the math, get used to it. You know that's the that's the other expression from one of the mathematicians used once. You don't understand math, you get used to it. <laughs> well, if, you, if, if you're going to use math to do science, you better understand it because you have. To. Um, but uh, it's uh, the other thing actually once years ago, Don Rubin told me is that whenever you're learning a new area in statistics, go back to the very early papers, right? Because in the very early papers, they were struggling with how to do it and they hadn't slicked up the mess so you can't understand what's going on. It's very similar to, to your planned uh, teaching lesson because the early literature would be kind of doing these you know, uh, sort of haphazard walks towards something really spiffy, but they're not there yet. So you'll understand the spiffy method because it was spiffy, spiffy, spiffy method resolved all these earlier efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another thing. Also, you know, you've heard the Ruta Jung episode, uh, which will have come out by the time uh, people hear this interview. And, you know, how he talks about how at the beginning, when people are really breaking, like really forging a path, they're really thinking about the reasoning behind things. So that they're, they're the ones doing a lot of thought. And then the and it's not actually formalized in mathematics yet. It's essentially that intuition based learning. So effectively, they have intuition, creativity, they're charging ahead. And it's only once they've actually found something useful that some will come on, it might even be them at that point, but you know, then they come along and clean up and figure out the math. Um, but the problem in following in these people's footsteps is you get so swept up on having to learn the math and all the technical components to truly understand it that you've lost sight of the reasoning behind what they did in the first place. The best example I had was years ago, I was a graduate school we're studying for, I think it was a midterm in experimental design course. Uh, and we're talking about interactions. And so I said, well, I could you know, make a, two by two table with an interaction in it. And they go, what do you mean? Okay, so the treatment effect is different in A plus versus B plus. And it's, these are the means, right? And so the means are different. So that's, that's an interaction. And they go, what are you talking about means? This is analysis of variance. So <laughs> they didn't understand that the analysis of variance, they, they were getting good marks in the course. But they didn't understand the analysis of variance was about looking for differences in means. They totally missed that. And it says variance in the name. <laughs> That's not, yeah. And, and I mean, like, they, you know, they were doing well in the course. You know, they could do all the formulas. And... I guess uh, this is teeing up to my next question. Um, well, I guess I think we've teed it up pretty well. Um, and we probably answered it by the time I asked, but um, is, uh, 
is statistics sufficiently science focused? So previously is science too statistics focused, and now it's is statistics sufficiently science focused? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. Okay, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, Q &E. I think it's I think it's improving, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when I took some of my stats courses, I guess it's about thirty years ago. It was like proof lemma lemma proof lemma. <laughs> Whereas now, I think you know most of them have a, a little bit of science. I mean, obviously not enough, um, and people are doing more to sort of uh, work with actual data uh, and do sort of more live like examples uh, but again there's the, there's no really uh there's no real discussion of what is scientific method or scientific reasoning i think um you know if, if, if we could survey or actually better audit statisticians working statisticians jump in drop into their office and ask them pointed questions they have to answer you know people might think Things like science is objective, or you know, science is a collection of known facts. Or yeah, really naive views. Um, and you hear you hear a lot of them in in the, the frequentist phase uh, battles about you know uh, not making assumptions or um, not so much for, um, no, not bringing in judgment. You know, you shouldn't shouldn't be bringing in expertise. You should let the data, the data speak for itself. And I like the line that Sandra Greenland used for that data speaking for themselves. If you think data is speaking from yourself for themselves, you need help from a psychiatrist, not a statistician. <laughs> yeah. But, but, it, but in, 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 it's not their fault. I mean, there's not any, uh, there's not really any space to learn more nuanced senses about you know scientific method and scientific reasoning um and you know most philosophy of science courses if you went into them you're not going to probably get much out of them um you know they they have a different um they're there for a different reason yeah one of the uh biggest things that i would like to see go by the wayside is this idea that uh, science is a essentially a collection of known facts. I think that is probably one of the po most poisonous misrepresentations of science. And the thing is, that it's not even a fair one to have because I don't think you can read a popular science book that doesn't dispel that in some way. You know, like uh, as uh, 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 Carl Sagan, um, is it Demon Haunted World? I was... Uh, reading that a few months ago and you know he basically dispels it every chapter there's nothing that richard dawkins says for example that he doesn't knock that one out in a way um a lot of just popular science you know they focus on the methods and things like that um and the discovery process um but it gets said so much that i think that anyone who has done any amount of reading and even very very tractable publicly available popular science books should have heard this, and I just don't understand why people haven't. Um... Well, especially now with the pandemic, there's, there's a lot of conversation on the radio with the listening to the radio about science evolving, and that if it's changing, that's a good sign because they're learning. Uh, but uh, the other one is Brian Ripley once said, I'll quote him so I won't be insulting people myself. <laughs> Statisticians don't read. <laughs> Most of them don't. Um, uh, and, and that's the other thing you'll 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 see a lot when when people reference your papers. Uh, often they haven't read them. Maybe they've scanned the abstract. It probably ended up there because one of the reviewers said you should reference so and so. Mm -hmm. Or uh, better yet, if you were the reviewer, say, "Oh, you really ought to reference Glenn on this one." Uh, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, that, must, yeah. <laughs> that's hard. I mean, I've been in a position a couple of times. And, you know, talked to the editor and I said, "Look, you know, I don't know of anyone else to reference other than my own work that will actually deal with this specific issue." And most editors are okay, but you really have to be careful that you you have to have a good reason to reference yourself. But uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, I know I get sort of uh, pigeonholed where there's a 
within IEEE, I get like not a small number of uh, papers very specifically related to essentially the intersection of, we'll just put it as like biological time series, patient biosign monitoring, uh, Bayesian non-parametrics, where I get a fair number of offers and they come so close. Um, and fortunately, um, I always get a little bit tickled when someone does reference me and I happen to be one of the uh, reviewers on it. Um, just as a disclaimer, of course, I've never actually suggested that anyone does it, but I do find it funny that the idea that someone would uh, use their position as a reviewer to get more more citations. Um, but the nice thing is like, you do actually get a good, uh, this is going into much of a can of worms, but there you could get a very good dialogue if the if the if the, liter if the review process were more functional than what it currently is, you could have way better dialogues um, because effectively, when you really know what someone has, like the, the never mind, I was about to open up another can of worms. I'll, I'll, I'll move on, but yeah, it is it is something interesting where um, there is an interplay between once people know to think of you in a certain field, you do end up getting a whole bunch of review requests for things in your in your niche. Yeah, I've been. Uh, I generally just say no because I'm not in academia anymore. So it's, it's, you know, I don't have that. Um, if if I review a paper, there's no kind of uh, no one has a checkbox. In fact, it's almost the opposite. Um, having said that, there's a few. What's really satisfying when you review a paper is when you review one really critically. And then the authors come back and they've really improved the work. Um, and there was one editor once in contact and he said, uh, the, the authors just didn't do what you suggested. Uh, are you still up for reviewing it? And I said, yes. And the authors came up with something much better than I suggested. I was really happy to let the editor know that the paper was really good. Um, so there can be rewards of reviewing, but um, I, I generally just don't because there's no there's no advantage to me right now. Um, I've been talking to somebody who's looking at, uh, I won't talk about the idea too much, but essentially to get a better um, reward mechanism to bring uh, essentially very engaged functional reviewers back into the scientific review process um, that I think would be very helpful. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that there's a, there's a positive story because very frequently, what I experience is you try to give people very good, helpful feedback to essentially to buff up the scientific validity of an experiment. And the goal of many authors in the face of review is so what is the minimal I can do? Or worst case, oh, I'm not gonna win anything here. I might as well skip over to another journal uh, that might not have had the author. Essentially, so it's like, if I try enough journals, eventually one will have three authors who aren't paying any attention and they'll let this go through without any uh, edits. Yeah, academia has a lot of challenges. And a quick one that, that Mike Evans pointed out to me, he reviewed a paper once and the author referenced something and, and Mike was interested in the reference. So he read the reference and he said, oh, reference, he goes back on his review, the reference clearly shows what this author is doing is wrong. So they rejected the paper. A year later, he sees the, sees the same paper unchanged in another journal and he looks at the references and that reference that Mike used to find out was wrong is missing. He just hmm. admitted it and got it published that way. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a shame. I, I don't know how they're going to fix academia. It's a huge uh, challenge. But, um, well, I guess maybe that leads to um, the, the next question, the, my, our penultimate question. Um, what is one topic that you'd like to see statisticians debate? Um. Yeah, I think uh, scientific reasoning and representation in statistics is a kind of a, a prerequisite for doing uh, good applied work. Um, I think that would, it might even be time for something like that. Um, you know, you have to remember, I don't know if it was 15, 20 years ago, applied statistics was a bad, bad word. <laughs> Most statisticians didn't want to do anything applied. But, uh, so it, it's changing, and I think, you know, it's, it, and I actually don't want to get into too much, but you, sometimes these change or, changes are driven by what what feedback we're getting on our work. Um, 
and the most important feedback is is a reality when it <laughs> complains that you know it just frustrates you and then people learn that uh, they're not as smart as they thought they were and i guess our final question for the day is um what is one topic that you would like to see the scientific community debate um yeah i i i <laughs> I'd probably say the same thing. Um, uh, maybe because it's science more generally, this issue of uh, alternative ways of, of, of getting a better sense of good and choir other than philosophy of science, you know, making it into something other than, you know, you know not omitting philosophers, but taking it out of the philosophy of science camp and putting it into mainstream, you know, science. I mean, the, the speaker I mentioned who, who pointed out that no one learns uh, scientific reasoning anywhere in their program, he wasn't a statistician. He was talking about science areas, and uh, his point was you you learn how you learn the accepted methods in your science at that point in time, um, and. Uh, and then, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people in their careers, the, the only time they really can put a lot into learning newish things is when they're in graduate school. Um, afterwards, they, they often, for various career pressures outside of academia, inside academia, they really can't invest a lot of time in learning unless they're doing it in, you know, on their off hours and weekends. And not everyone wants to live that way. So. Yeah. Well. I guess that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have these type of podcast conversations where we could um, provide a tractable way for people to start getting access to these types of ideas. You know, when we started the philosophy of data science series um, and starting off, um, you know, first thing we do is obviously have to show Andrew Gelman so that people pay attention. And then subsequent to that, um, you know, this reintroduction of, you know, what is the difference between abductive, deductive, inductive reasoning? Why does it matter for data science? It's not some philosophical thing. This is actually very practical. These are fundamental building bricks for us to do perform inquiry. Um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, hopefully uh, people are get, getting some something from that. And um, I, mean, I think yeah. I think it's, it's it's very good. I think it's a great idea. Um, when I was learning statistics, the only time you get this kind of material is if after a seminar or you know to symposium or something, the, the speaker would go to the bar and you'd be sitting okay. around the bar talking about these kinds of ideas. There was a, when I was in uh, Oxford in the, in the stats department, David Cox gave a really nice talk for the graduate students talking about these kinds of issues. And at the end, one of the students said, well, you, you should write that out. And he goes, no, 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 I would never put that in, in writing. So it's, um, so it's great that that these exist, and, and after you, which Brian Ripley then would have said, "Ah, oh, statistician wouldn't have read it in the first place." <laughs> well, there's yeah, I mean, there's there's always that comeback, but um, I, I think he was talking about most statisticians, if not all statisticians. But, uh... Cool. Well, Keith, again, so thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate going uh, through these ideas uh, for the first time, and. Um, uh, I look forward to having you on again in the future. Sounds good. Thanks, Glenn. Have a good day.